Hey, hello everyone. Welcome. Oh, I, I, ooh, it's like, wish this was my classroom. Students just <laughs> listen to my voice and just quiet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. Um, I have the wonderful pleasure of doing the land acknowledgement and an intro for the woman of the hour, Jamie, directly at you. Um, so let's get today rolling with the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land. And that's the statement UFT has written. I'll continue, though. As we sit and listen to histories of erasure and remembrance today, I also ask you to reflect on your position on the land we gather on here, or wherever you are online. That's the camera. <laughs> One block west to us is Spadina Road, which comes from the Ojibwe word Ishpadina, meaning a place on a hill, which Hayden King says Spadina is the bastardization of that word. If we look a bit to the north, we find Gideoni Gumming, or Old Portage, or Davenport which references the trail between the Don and the Humber Rivers, which we sit between today. As Sarah Roque and Selena Mills say, Davenport may be another street I walk down, but it's not just another thoroughfare. For me, it's an ancient portage trail that holds indigenous knowledge. If we look to the east on the street the presenter and I are currently sharing, Charles Street, and further the streets around the gay village, we can enter more recent histories of what trans two-spirit activist Monica Forrester describes as the corner. Noting the histories of trans sex workers squatting in abandoned boarded up houses, underground garages, which are now condos, Leaker Street, Ho Homewood, Maitland, as the marvelous grounds of trans sex strolls in the 80s and 90s. Next time you walk down there or wherever, consider what histories, knowledges, and peoples were pushed out. Consider your position in our shared world as you add to the contours of the city, which was where there are trees standing in the water, the gathering place of fishes, to Toronto, where I quote, nations from all over Turtle Island met and traveled through this land. Many languages were spoken, alliances and, de and decisions were made, people from different nations met and intermarried, and the dish with one spoon treaty was made. I end again with Sarah Roque, quote, for Indigenous people, land acknowledgements are not only to assert their sovereignty and treaty rights today, but it's also a way for all peoples to feel connected to a place. And I'll pass it to Chris. Hello. It wouldn't be a queer event if we didn't start late. All right. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning for those of us in person uh, over Zoom and to those watching this as a recording. So excited to be here, both for this talk, but also to be in a room filled with so many wonderful people. My name is Chris Ino Pilak, and I helped to organize this event. And to that end, here's the talk schedule. After my brief overview, I'll turn it back over to Sam Sanchino, who will provide an introduction, if she needs none, of today's speaker, Jamie Jesperson. <laughs> Jamie will then speak for around 50 minutes before we have a, a generative Q&A facilitated by Sam. So this will be a hybrid Q&A. So for those on Zoom, uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A uh, box to really feel in community. Uh, although given our tech troubles, we'll kind of see how this goes. Uh, I'll unmute and enable video for anyone on Zoom uh, so that you can directly ask Jamie your question. If you would just like your question read by Sam, uh, please indicate that uh, when you pose it. As well, this event is being recorded. So please be aware of that as well uh, regarding being on camera. But enough logistics. I'm so excited to be here. As we gather in this space in person or on Zoom due to the support of seven departments and groups at the University of Toronto. I would like to thank the Women and Gender Studies Institute, Sexual Diversity Studies, the Faculty of Information's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Unit, Department of History, the University of Toronto Graduate Student Union, the History Student Union, and the LGBTQ Oral History Digital Collaboratory. Thank you. In addition, I would like to thank all those who volunteered their time to make this possible. Uh, Elspeth Brown, Atticus Hawk, Janish Kent, Betsy Moss, Tanya Rormoser, 
Alicia Stranges, Monica Tafoldi, and Corey Wilcock. And thank you to you for being here. And thank you to all those uh, who shared the event with your departments, listservs, and with your friends. I believe very firmly that community is a verb. It's something you do. Uh, and the enthusiastic response that we've seen to this event really exemplifies that. And now I have the pleasure of turning things over to my sister and someone who I am so happy to be in community with, Sam Sentinel. Again. Okay. How do you introduce a friend? You know, it's a difficult question. Someone you admire. But let's start with what she sent me. <laughs> <laughs> J.B. Jesperson is a Vanier Scholar and PhD candidate in history and cultural, social, and political thought at University of Victoria. Trained in ethno-historical and counter-archival methods, Jamie studies Indigenous and colonial North America through a trans lens with a focus on histories of trans-Indigenous concepts along the Pacific course, coast. Amazing. Jamie's writing has received a growing number of awards, including the 2024 CLGBTH Gregory Sprague Prize, the 2023 Gender and History Graduate Student Essay Prize, and the 2022 Reese Davies Prize for the Best MA Dissertation in the UK. Ooh. Her writing can be found or is forthcoming in History Workshop, Spectator, Gender and History, The Graduate History Review, and Transgender Studies Quarterly. Beautiful. Humble. I love it. <laughs> but I want to share a little more. I was brought in to introduce Jamie by my sister, Chris, and I'm not a historian. <laughs> I do theology with trans studies, but I couldn't say no to the offer. So how else could I introduce Jamie except by talking about myself a little? Humor me. In high school, <laughs> we're going back. I thought I wanted to be a history professor. My friend told me history was useless and really I should be thinking about finance or economics, but this set my mind more. Out of spite, I entered York University as a history undergraduate and that was short lived. <laughs> I hated that I couldn't play with historical events. I didn't understand how to analyze the past, still kind of don't, and I just found it dreadfully boring. And I still kind of do. <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> This is not history. Uh, fast forward about 10 years, and I first meet Jamie through a call for reviewers for her and Chris's special issue of Graduate History Review, Trans Histories by Trans Historians. What ensued were long email conversations going back and forth about research, crimson fonts, sizes for breast augmentations, being surgical <laughs> twins, uh, sex work paths, and a somewhat frantic Toronto layover. And from Chris, a quote, creepy email detailing her arrival to UFT and her wanting to connect with the other trans femmes here. I asked her to send me some of her work and I read a version of Remembering Trans Feminine Life and Death of and New Spain, 1604, 18, 1604 to 1821, now published in Gender and History. And I am floored. From the outset, I met with histories of erasure, of proclamations that God will eradicate from you from Earth eradicate you from earth and Jamie's distinct assertion assertion that this historical violence stems from trans feminine people's trans femininity. The absence of trans misogyny in the colonial archive as developed by which Jamie quips cis historians CIS cis historiography and cis history at large is what Jamie writes against. Her work serves to remember maybe a little macabre meta metaphor, or re-story, or as with her work with Two-Spirit Trans Woman, Salish Wesley notes, that these stories have so much power, so much influence, they need to be told, the world needs to know. That's from our article, Twin Spirit Woman. As such, Jamie asks us, asks us in honoring trans lives, historic historicizing trans death, how does the murder of trans people or people with trans guests, the gender binary have a history? She asks us what happens when we consider that 50% of reported trans deaths are of trans sex workers. And as such, she, as such here, she asks us to really consider what it means to understand trans history as a sex work history. As a self-indulgent, narcissistic, vain, ex-sex working Latina trans woman with delusions of grandeur, I love it. <laughs> Let's fast forward some more. And I've written a short piece in the special issue, and Jamie has taken the lead on developing a panel for QHC on the histories of trans femininity, 
push she's brought me and Chris in to as well. And I still don't see myself as a historian. But what I want to say from this is that what I read from history, from how Jamie does history, is that it's about our entanglements, ourselves, our communities. I mean, just look right around you here. I can think of a good amount of trans and non-binary graduate scholars here at U of T. The number lessens when we think of trans scholars doing trans studies. And again, I could count on my hand the trans feminine scholars doing trans studies here. And on the eve of the tentative agreement, not even the eve, the day after, of the tentative agreement between the University of Toronto and our QP3902, I'm left wondering about trans graduate students, trans feminine ones specifically. As Kai Ching Tom writes, and I hope we choose love, if you're a trans girl with trans feminine friends, you're probably at most two degrees of separation from sex work. True. Trans femme participation in sex work to either get through university grad school as a method of survivance, or maybe just to, quoting Jamie's research, go in women's apparel to get a bit from my cat, is readily apparent when you ask the right people. As such, it stands true when Jamie and Chris write that they see their work as part of a necessary step in filling in trans historiography from a trans point of view. Getting near the end. In this work, I see Jamie at every step bringing community with her. She brings kinship and entangles us within histories. She brings and is brought by Salish Wesley, Chris Vilak, myself, Esther Suwanana, and Joanna Cifredo, Thomasine Hall, Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, La Conchita, La Luna, La Marosa, Las Rosas, La Sangariana, La Coquita de la Encarnacion, Señora La Grande, La Golondrina, La Capulina, La Borrega, La Almoloya, Mary Jones, and more. A good number of those are sex worker names. Mm. To end, I will return once more to Salish Wesley. In her work with Jamie, Salish describes trans and two-spirit people's journeys to self-realization as, quote, our path to wholeness. And I see Jamie's work similarly. I end this intro, intro still maybe not as a historian, but recognizing myself as what Jamie has called me, a her historian. I am grateful at this opportunity. You're a dear friend and sister. And as such, everyone, please welcome with me, Jamie Jesperson. <laughs> Right, I just got my mic on. Does that work? Um, it could not be a trans femme welcome if I wasn't ready. Red to fill. So thank you, Sam, for that. Um, and thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Elspeth, for having me here, organizing this wonderful event. And especially a thank you to um, everyone who's come. It really warms my heart. Um, and it's overwhelming and humbling. Um, and I thank you for, for being here. Um, let me dive in. Trans history is sex work history. From the curious 14th century case of London prostitute Eleanor Reichenau to the legendary formation of street transvestite action revolutionaries by Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera in 1970s New York. Iconic stories of trans women who built lives out of the sexual service economy shaped the contours of trans history across the ages in so-called North America, where I stand. Trans feminine sex workers have been a fixture of popular settler culture since at least the late uh, 17th century. In a tantalizing 1629 court case in colonial Virginia, indentured servant Thomasine Hall famously confounded a jury of townspeople by revealing her past life as a male soldier. When probed for why she now lived as she did, Paul declared, I go in woman's apparel to get a bit for my cat. In other words, she did a good sex. Nowhere is this phenomenological link between trans feminine life and sex work more documented than in the mid 20th century, namely the epoch of gay liberation. As outlined by trans cultural theorist Vivian K. Namaste, gay liberation in North America was born out of transsexual public spaces. 
areas of cities known for their constant presence of transsexual and transvestite sex workers, many of whom ignited resistance themselves. Indeed, as illuminated by mother of trans history, Susan Stryker, the main sites of rebellion, Cooper Donuts, Compton's Cafeteria, Stonewall, were all underpinned by a geography of trans sex work. The very sisterhood of the two women most associated, perhaps anachronistically, with this movement uh, themselves met while hustling in the early 1960s. It was on 42nd Street and 6th Ave that 11-year-old Marcia, 11-year-old Sylvia, mustered up the strength to initiate an introduction to seasoned 17-year-old Marcia. It was then and there that Marcia took Sylvia under her wing and the rest was her street. For the past half century, the trans feminine sex worker, especially the trans feminine sex worker of color, has served as a popular trope in American media. As illuminated by Lamanda Horton Stalling, referencing the words of T.S. Madison, the very etymology of the slur trainee is specifically linked with the history and culture of sex work, especially of and by Black trans women. Indeed, the very first trans person I ever saw as a child was the Black trans sex worker and blast from the past. When the father character Calvin emerges from his family's underground bunker in 1999, one of the first people he interacts with, no doubt, Really take it off. <laughs> okay, I can project. Um, so when the father cares, stay with me. Blast from the past. Who's seen Blast from the past? Yeah, a few of us. Okay, great. Thank you. Actually, it's a terrible film. 1998 film. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, when the father character Calvin emerges from his family's underground bunker in 1999, one of the first people he interacts with, no doubt symbolizing the arriving millennium, is a black trans woman working the streets. So to the naive white man's question of what she is, actress Jasmine Nicola Creighton responds, hell, I can be whatever you want me to be. For at least the last 50 years, though it seems trans women and the broader American consciousness could be one thing and one thing only, sex workers. Despite such popular and far-reaching renderings of trans feminine sex work, the co-constitutive and perhaps fundamental relationship between trans womanhood and sex work has only just begun to be historicized in depth. Leveraging my research and studies as a trans feminine historian of indigenous and colonial North America, and just as importantly, an ex-sex worker myself, I want to offer this lecture, which is part of a book chapter, um, as just a small snapshot of trans sex work history before the more well-known 20th century. So taking up historian Jules Gail Peterson's call for what she calls a materialist trans woman of color's history of sexuality, um, I want to take a micro-historical approach to survey three tales of trans-feminine sex workers, majority of whom we may describe today as Black, Latina, and Indigenous, from three corners of the continent. Ordered chronologically, I begin with the explosive Mexico City sodomy trials of the late 1650s, through which a distinct underground subculture of India, Mestiza, Mulata, Negra, and Spanish trans feminine sex workers was spectacularly unearthed in the Royal High Court. Through a mix of colonial hysteria and loose lips, a total of 123 people were summoned across the vice royalty of New Spain for suspected sodomy. Many of them specifically targeted, arrested, tortured, and in some cases executed for their sexually transgressive femininity. Using court summaries, witness statements, and testimonies from this case and several more throughout the 18th century, big shout out to the archival appendix of Zeb Torrici's Sins Against Nature, excellent book. I illuminate how the subcultural trans feminine world these women belonged to was defined, ordered, and inspired then by none other than the um, sexual service industry developing in colonial Mexico. Traveling up the Pacific coast to jointly owned uh, British American Oregon country, I moved to an influential, albeit brief story of an indigenous trans woman caught and punished for soliciting sex from British sailors at Fort Vancouver. While treated as an anomaly among the British fur trade, 
this trans woman, like those before her in New Spain, belonged to a millennia old indigenous world in which a logic of mythical and physical transformation grounded her cultural reality. Tracing the decade of colonial correspondence pertaining to her controversial encounter between fur traders, settlers, and the US government, I unearthed the great influence an indigenous trans feminine sex worker unwillingly had on the gradual unsettling of the British Empire and the Pacific West. Crossing the continent to antebellum New York in the same decade, I conclude by examining the salacious media campaign against free black brothel work, Mary Jones, you may have all heard of. Arrested for picking the pockets of dozens of Johns um, in 1836, Mary's side of the story was recorded in a rowdy city court and then disseminated for weeks in the penny press. Representing the kinds of fungible strategies and lives made possible through chattel slavery's ungendering of black flesh, Jones's engagement in sex work was deeply intertwined as Gil Peterson so beautifully lays out in A Short History of Trans Misogyny with her pursuit and practice of freedom. Unlike the many black people who cross-dressed out of captivity, however, Jones, likely born free, led her entire life, adult life, guided by her own trans feminine whims, even in the face of constant scrutiny and criminalization. So jumping from colonial New Spain to the British fur trade to antebellum America, these three stories of trans sex workers living under three connected but distinct imperial regimes uh, to me offer important insights into the colonial racial and sexual strictures that mediated past trans feminine life. By weaving their stories together across temporalities, geographies, and worlds, I hope to trace the undeniable yet heretofore under-acknowledged link between trans femininity and sex work on this land, one that absolutely continues to this day. Um, and now I want to give just a content warning as suggested in the title of this paper, Trans Misogyny in the Colonial Archive, um, that I will be sharing stories of colonial trans misogyny, trans misogynoir, settler colonialism, genocide. Um, but as a counter history, I'm hoping to illuminate um, uh, resistance and survivance despite uh, this violence plus them. So starting with Mexico City, New Spain. In its three centuries of reign between 1535 and 1821, the vice royalty of New Spain sunk its imperial claws into the majority of central, modern Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean, Florida, and the Western United States. Built atop the ruins of Tenochtitlan, the heart of the fallen Mexica Empire, Mexico City served as an epicenter of early colonial Spanish military, religion, and education. Through the horrific decimation of up to 95% of the region's indigenous population, the enslavement and importation of up to 200,000 West Africans, and then the gradual migration of Iberian settlers, Mexico City by the 17th century was a largely multicultural, multilingual society. Despite housing such a diverse population, one even organized in up to 16 ethnic categories, the largely outnumbered Spanish aristocracy and clergy remained in constant power over the laboring and enslaved classes. As evidenced in the records of early explorers, conquistadors, and friars, there was almost immediate Spanish anxiety around indigenous sexuality upon contact, namely what they called sins against nature, including sodomy, which were believed to have, quote, extensively contaminated provinces of New Spain. As I explore in my new article, Trans Misogyny in the Colonial Archive, a recurring and distinct feature of this perceived contamination was the indigenous trans woman, referred to uh, by the Spanish with a host of words, camoya, oh, camoya, joya, amujarado, afeminado, who were quickly uh, collapsed by a Spanish Catholic um, kind of framework of sim simply sodomy. Although largely understood as a nefarious sexual act between people back in Spain, sodomy in the New World, once seemingly chock full of men dressed as women, became increasingly associated with the traits of an individual, namely effeminacy. In the mid 16th century Florentine Codex, an expansive bilingual Nahuatl Spanish cultural document. Oh, we go back. I the scroll. Okay. Uh, there we are. 
Puto, the colloquial term for sodomite was defined as effeminate. He passes himself off as a woman. He deserves to be burnt. He deserves to be scorched. He deserves to be set on fire. He burns as the fire blazes. He speaks like a woman and dresses like a woman. This is a cultural definition of what it means to be a sodomite in Mexico City, in New Spain. But representing a more complex taxonomy, the Nahua side of the codex offers a series of Nahua words for individuals who transgress Spanish sexual norms. Like the Spanish, the indigenous peoples of Highland Mesoamerica did order their societies into a binary gender system of roles, rituals, and behavior that's how to bring structure to everyday life. Far from demonstrative of a limited view of the world, though, Mesoamerican binaries were formed to streamline acceptably complex realities of gender ambiguity, accepted instability of the body, and the wide variation of personal trait. Unlike the Spanish, the Nahua, a vast cultural group that stretched from present day Mexico to uh, as south as Panama, understood gender as socialized, mutable, and not necessarily linked to a sexed body. This meant that one's mastery of certain skills, adoption of distinct mannerisms, and use of specific modes of dress could reassign their gender. Put simply, a boy could become a woman by simply growing up to dress like one and using spinning and weaving tools. It's not that deep. <laughs> this gendered cultural reality is illustrated in the sketch to Sochiwake in Book 10 of the Coda. Recorded by the Spanish as, quote, men dressed as women. So Chihuahua performed the feminine task of spinning and, and sewing. Um, and across Nahua society, it was common for So Chihuahua to take residence in homes of nobles or in temples, where they would perform household chores and, quote, be available for sexual favors. During times of war, they were known to accompany soldiers, who they likewise provided, quote, a variety of services, including sex. As suggested in their name, these women were culturally associated with flowers, symbols more generally representative in Nahua imagery of prostitutes, including the Nahua goddess of fertility and sexual excess. The seemingly individual act of gender crossing, though, reflected a much larger communal cultural belief and transformation. Along with many popular hallucinogens, the beverage bulke was believed to have the power to shape shift its consumer into animals or natural phenomena. In an anxious letter from Jose Vidal de Figueroa to the king, it is noteworthy that the clergyman attributes the city's moral downfall to pulqueria, taverns that not only catered to indigenous and laboring classes, but also hosted, quote, Indians dressed as women who would provoke men into the clumsy act of having sex with them. Caught within this dangerous, uh, reductive colonial category of sodomy, countless trans feminine people of various cultural backgrounds would find themselves in Mexican criminal and inquisition courts throughout the early colonial period. As first unearthed by historian Sergei Gruzinski in the 1980s, the highest volume of Mexican sodomy accusations were in fact confined to just three years alone. Between 1656 and 1658, a record number of 123 individuals were summoned by edicts and town criers for suspected sodomy in the large metropolitan centers. While my article reads against what I call as historiography to critique purely sexual readings of the case that have posited these people as simply effeminate men, um, I want to clarify here through this talk that this does not mean that these subjects lived sexless lives. Rather, their underground countercolonial world hinged on the city's vibrant sexual service economy. They were very sexual human beings. The epoch of hysteria in the 1650s found its catalyst in the spontaneous detailed testimony of someone who I solely remember with her chosen name, La Stampa. Once a linda niña, or pretty girl, the now 70-year-old Mestiza found herself apprehended by court magistrates for suspected sodomy in 1656. After torture and interrogation, the elder relented, revealing the secrets of an underground community theretofore unknown to the colonial government. Within that world, Estampa served as a pillar, known as the <laughs> known as the uh, courier and courtesan of secret gatherings, uh, for which she set and shared locations and dates. 
Coinciding with Catholic peace days, Estampa and her friends hosted receptions with guapos, uh, what they called the man who loved them, for dancing, singing, drinking chocolate, fighting over lovers, and as the night drew on, retiring for sex in separate rooms. Among the niñas, Estampa was known for her superior sexual knowledge, including how to eat a man like a frog from the waist down. In other words, how to suck him off. <laughs> um, like La Estampa, this trans feminine cohort took names following a specific naming convention. Uh, across the list of the accused, we'll meet La Conchita, La Luna, La Morosa, Las Rosas, and more. While many of these names allegedly came from the most beautiful women in Mexico City, some of them, such as La Zangariana, originated from, quote, common horse. The very article titled Naming Convention was culturally understood to show deference and most importantly, denoted prostitution. In the early autumn of 1657, a mulata known as La Cotita de la Encarnacion joined the trial. 30 years Estampa's junior, Cotita held a similar reputation among the next generation, affectionately known as Senora la Grande or Lady the Great. Since the age of six, Cotita wore only feminine dress. As an adult, she donned a melindre on her forehead, paired with a white jacket packed with colorful ribbons on the sleeves that sashayed from one side to the other following the rhythm of her hips. To witnesses, Cotita was commonly surrounded by male prostitutes, beautiful male prostitutes, with whom she used endearments such as my soul, my sweetheart, my love. In turn, those friends knew only to call her by her chosen name, La Cotita. One even reporting to the court in his testimony that she would be offended otherwise. According to another's testimony, rumors of an attempted roundup by colonial authorities following Cotita's attempted escape and then subsequent arrest in 1657 spread swiftly throughout the city, enabling the majority of suspects to flee. In the end of the three-year witch hunt, 14 of the total 123 were convicted, nine others used as informants, and one aged 15 sentenced to 200 lashes and six years of forced mortar labor. It was on November 6, 1658 that Estampa, Cotita, and 12 others saw their fate. After being tied together by rope and escorted to their execution site, they were spat on, shouted at, and then publicly garroted in front of an audience several hundred spectators. Their bodies left to burn in a bonfire that allegedly burned all night. The following morning, it said that Cotita's ashes were collected by her friends, I suspect her gaggle of sex workers, and then poured into Lake Texcoco. The whereabouts of the 99 suspects who evaded colonial capture, however, remained a mystery to the colonial government. But a notably similar sodomy trial, unsuccessful sodomy trial of several a mujeraro publicos, publicly trans feminine people, essentially later suggests the continuity of the subculture in the state just south, Puebla. In 1771, a group of at least eight were investigated for similarly dressing as women and regularly inviting over men to drink and dine with them. As was in the case in the mid 17th century, several of these people went by similar names. La Golondrina, La Capulina, La Borega, and La Almoloya. In a revealing statement, La Golondrina's defense lawyer explained to the court, one can be afeminado in name, in appearance, by one's own inclination, and by the malicious use of one's sex. Thus, in colonial Mexico, it seems that trans femininity was not only marked by chosen names, dress, and desires, which we would assume, but also by one sexuality. For many of these women then, their being sex workers and their being amujarado, afeminado, or otherwise trans feminine were in fact inseparable. So between taking on names that denoted prostitution and defining their femininity through the malicious use of their sex, Trans women of colonial Mexico shaped their subcultural worlds around and through sex work. In turn, ongoing Spanish imperial attempts to subdue counter-colonial trans feminine life was part and parcel with the colonial regulation of unruly sexuality, already two centuries in the making. Perhaps most importantly, despite coordinated and unrelenting legal suppression, 
trans women would continue to exist and resist across New Spain. While it is harrowing, the 1658 execution of Codita and others who were in their 70s and 80s evidences a cohort of trans women who not only carved out temporary reprieve from colonial trans misogyny, but got to live entire lives ordered by their own rules. Up until their dying breaths, several of them even retained the audacity to not repent for their sins. One of them declaring she had lived this way for over 30 years. In her testimony, Estampa herself declared, I'm happy this present century is ending as people did not enjoy this one as in the past. <laughs> Gesturing perhaps to me towards a previous era beyond such violence. Indeed, a brief survey of the 123 who were initially summoned shows how a large number of suspects lived an array of interesting lives as confectioners, pigtail makers, wig makers, puppeteers, harp players, and in one case, the owner of a bulqueria, which must have been the place to be in mid 17th century Mexico. <laughs> Despite the spectacular execution of the 1650s, the trial of 1771, more than a century after uh, just uh, in Puebla in the city just to the south, suggests to me that these underground communities lived on, no doubt carrying their long held traditions and naming and partying and quarreling over guapos to the next generation and the next generation after that. Fort Vancouver, Oregon country. In the early to mid 19th century, the Pacific Northwest was uh, better known to the imperial powers as Oregon country. Following the 1818 convention and the 1819 Adams-Onis Treaty, land west of the Rocky Mountains and north of the 42nd parallel was relinquished by New Spain into joint American-British occupation. As British settlement waned in the wake of American and Canadian independence, such occupation, though, was tenuous, with Great Britain really only represented by the international fur trading enterprise, the Hudson's Bay Company, which relied on low, uh, lone fur trappers. Largely outnumbering the few hundred British traders and American settlers of early 19th century Oregon were dozens of powerful surrounding indigenous nations, each connected through strong and long established kinship and trade networks. Through indigenous facilitated marriages of newly arrived European traders with indigenous women, up to 80% of Fort Vancouver, the region's uh, HBC headquarters, was mixed race in the 1810s. In addition to becoming influential fur trade wives, the glue of the multilingual trade, indigenous women, far from restrained by the patriarchal values of Western Europe, also gained unprecedented economic opportunities to sell sex, the homosocial trade ports. According to historian Carol Cooper, there was little censure. There was a little censure. People gotta tell me if I'm like go on YouTube or something. Um, there was little censure of Native women who engaged in sexual activity for payment. Instead, sexual relations in this region were culturally a part of gift giving. And for example, among the Simshian, a means to impart luck and power and a way to cement alliances between tribes or communities. So just as this region was home to relatively unrestrained sexuality, so too did it witness the crossing of gender. At least two dozen Coast Salish nations, as many from this region would be called in the future, hold on to language to describe subjects, both mythical and mortal, who transform their gender. This very small snapshot from the larger list I'm in the early stages of compiling provides just a sample of several dozen unique nation-specific concepts exist across the indigenous Pacific Northwest. As reported by so-called father of modern anthropology, Franz Boas, in 1890, quote, men who assume women's dress and occupations and vice versa were found all along the North Pacific coast. Just like down south in colonial Mexico, these transfeminine figures garnered constant, albeit brief mentions in the diaries, letters, and reports of foreigners across the long 19th century. To the myriad competing imperial regimes, they were perceived and feared to be everywhere. Where there were indigenous women engaged in sex work then, there were indigenous women who were trans, who too built lives out of the growing trader sexual economy. 
through judicious study of the British colonial archive, I want to trace here a harrowing uh, microhistory of just one indigenous trans feminine sex worker who made a brief, very impactful appearance at Fort Vancouver in the early 1830s. On the mouth of the Columbia River, British fur traders witnessed, recorded, and widely circulated a controversial encounter with, in their very limited frameworks, an indigenous man dressed up as a woman. Just like the trans feminine people of colonial Mexico who came from indigenous worlds in which gender was not linked to the sex body, this indigenous trans woman was much more complex and real than anxious British logics of gender in the early 19th century could even begin to conceive. Far from simply a man dressed up as a woman, this sex worker represented a long-held Coast Salish trans feminine lifeway that dates back centuries, if not millennia. The story goes like this. In an anxious letter penned to the HBC governor and committee in early January 1837, John McLaughlin, the chief factor of Fort Vancouver, reported a gross and an atrocious calumny. Through chains of Fort Gossip, the so-called King of the Columbia, caught wind that the heated controversy between British sailors and an indigenous trans woman three winters back had been cited in a secret deposition against him. In a rushed attempt to vindicate himself before word traveled from Honolulu to the Foreign Office in London, McLaughlin wrote directly to headquarters. After initially denying the allegations in the body of his letter, though, McLaughlin pens a brief postscript that hints at harrowing the story. It was true. The chief factor relented. An Indian was emasculated by Dr. Gardner, the fort's 27-year-old physician, at the company hospital. However, McLaughlin had only been notified half an hour after the operation. The seemingly extreme action of castration on the part of the fort's doctor was warranted, McLaughlin sought to convey, by extreme circumstances. Quote, the fellow used to dress himself up as a female and go on board the vessels and offer himself to the sailors. At last, the sailors got hold of him, and Dr. Gardner emasculated him. Just as quickly as she enters the trader's tale, this indigenous trans woman is completely lost from it. Neither do we learn her name, nor do we know her nation, her story, nor most importantly, what happened to her after this forced operation. Instead, she's frozen in the colonial archive as a rascal who, after repeating offenses, endured a punishment so rash it shocked everyone who heard of it, British, Canadian, and American alike. What we do know from her brief appearance in the colonial records, which are really just a few mentions in letters, however, offers a critical glimpse into the lives of indigenous trans women upon colonial invasion. Not only does she dress as a woman over a long stretch of time, but she passed as one as well, gaining entry onto British ships to solicit sex with no problem across a series of months. When her abominable proposals eventually came to light, by whom and under what circumstances, I'm not sure yet, she was allegedly flogged by a group of sailors discouraging her to return. But despite immediate physical violence, this woman insisted on coming back. That is, until the deeply religious Dr. Gardner took the situation into his own hands. But most importantly, the extant source material unanimously suggests to me that she survived. The nearly decade-long trail of colonial correspondence relating to this incident reveals a great magnitude of controversy that, she, that it ignited between British and American powers, so-called Oregon country. As swaths of American settlers crossed the Rocky Mountains into what they would call the Willamette Valley, her story would be shared among opponents of British dominance, eventually leveraged in an appeal for U.S. intervention. On January 4th, 1839, her story, couched within a lengthy report of offenses, would even travel to the floor of the U.S. Committee on Foreign Affairs. Three years later, in 1842, a resolution was passed by the House of Representatives to print and distribute 10,000 copies of the report for public reading, spreading glimpses of her story to presumably thousands of readers across the U.S. The scandal of castration also continued to haunt McLaughlin's career up until his retirement in 1845. In a petition from U.S. settlers, the story was cited as evidence of his arbitrary acts, which was debated but then put to rest by the U.S. Senate in 1844. Having circulated through gossip in the months leading up to the famous 1843 meeting of Chicken 
This petition would further inspire the formation of the provisional government that would transition into the present states of Oregon and Washington. To the initial 1839 deposition, McLaughlin pens scathing 23 page response. Now four or five years after the incident, McLaughlin reveals a striking omission from his original correspondence with London. And this is a shocking omission. Um, displeased with Dr. Gardner's actions, McLaughlin claims to have called him to account directly after surgery, asserting he had no right to do what he had done. With religious zeal, Dr. Gardner asserted that his actions had no reference to his engagement to the company, but were rather done out of strong religious feelings. With little remorse, the British doctor declared, if the Indian had been in England, I would have had him hung. For nearly 200 years, this woman's story has been narrated, filtered, and circulated solely through a colonial archive and colonial case. Uh, her story is reduced to footnotes in various canonical monographs about Pacific Northwest history that presume she was a minor passive actor in larger, more imperial, more important imperial affairs. Just as in colonial New Spain, indigenous trans feminine sex workers held a distinct place in the colonial imaginary. Far from marginal, their lives, actions, and, and desires were placed center stage in the ongoing settlement of North America, continent colonized, no doubt, through their attempted elimination. While I'm too early in my research of this story to come to any definite conclusions, I want to counter the, I want to try to counter the trans misogyny of the colonial archive by briefly remembering this woman beyond the story of her attack. Contrary to the traitor's treatment of her as anomalous or incongruent within an allegedly British dominated territory, this woman, including her transness, represented a millennia old local tradition of transformation that was still vibrant in the 1830s. Her people, their networks, and their traditions vastly outnumbered and outpowered unsteady British colonial presence during the whole stretch of her life. Furthermore, her multiple trips to Vancouver, a temporary trading settlement, was built atop her ancestral lands, resembled an increasingly common and lucrative trade for Indigenous women who had success taking advantage of desperately homosocial ports. As demonstrated by local Two-Spirit resurgence efforts today, we know definitively that she was neither the first nor the last Coast Salish woman like her. To name just one possible well-known descendant, the esteemed Salish Wesley, two-spirit knowledge keeper who's aging into elderhood today. I don't want to stop there. In the early stages of tracing a few other uh, trans-Indigenous microhistories from this region for my dissertation, I'm left with a few more questions. When this woman was beaten and taken captive at Fort Vancouver, who came to her defense? What of the mysterious American captain who witnessed the attack and secretly filed a deposition against McLaughlin to get justice? Who was he? Was he a client, friend, a lover? Did this woman like Gotita and Estampa belong to a larger community of trans sex workers that protected one another? Being in the fort facing forced operation by a foreign medicine man, did this woman recall the very popular legends of her trans contemporary? Kankon Kamek Klaula, the wayfaring Tanaha prophet who claimed he was surgically transformed into a man by French traders just two decades before this event. What of the respected Spokane chief who wore woman's dress overloaded with a profusion of beads, thimbles, and small shells who was just up river from the fort at this time? Upon first notice of the attack, would she have jumped onto her horses, known as the fastest in the valley, to come to her sister's aid? Or, rumored to be an oracle who could control the weather, could this trans chiefess have conjured up a storm in revenge to rage down on Fort Vancouver? Did the hundreds of Coast Salish cis women who intermarried with fur traders and were living at the fort witness the attack and recall their relatives who looked like her? What about the story shared by their elders about cross-dressing tricksters, Ren, Coyote, and Mink, that no doubt colored their childhoods spent among their people? Did they feel a commitment to protect her or had colonial trans misogyny already torn their kinship ties apart, signaling a new era in which violence against trans women became acceptable and commonplace? What I do know thus far is that similar to the trans women in Puebla in the 1770s, 
trans people would be recorded all along the North Pacific coast by the first wave of settler anthropologists 60 years later. With colonial suppression and settlements only growing in size and power, could sex work as an at least somewhat viable form of trans feminine labor in the early contact period have remained linked to trans feminine survivance through the rest of the 19th century? I'm not sure. As recorded by Boaz though, at least the question is not if she or others like her survived, the question is how. And my last case study, which is gonna be the shortest, assuming most people have heard it before, uh, takes place in Antebellum, New York, 1836. So on the opposite side of the continent, in the North Atlantic, an equally salacious story of trans feminine sex work circulated the white settler press. But this time, it was a free Black woman named Mary Jones. Unlike the story from Fort Vancouver, the archive holds Mary's own words, albeit couched within, a la Gil Peterson, the historiography of a punchline from which her story rests. Examining the unique racial politics that mediated Mary's case and life in Antebellum, New York, unveils even more modalities and possibilities for trans feminine sex work across national contexts in the era of sla slavery's transition, as well as continued attempts toward suppression. So while returning home late one night in early June, 1836, white master Mason Robert Haslam made a curious discovery. Not only did his leather pocketbook and its accompanying bank bills and stage tickets appear to be missing, but they had been mysteriously replaced with the wallet of another man. From inside, Haslam drew a bank order, penned the exorbitant sum of $200. Stopping in his tracks, the Mason replayed the night's events. Several hours earlier, around 10 o'clock, he had crossed paths with an elegant young black woman on Bleecker Street. Where are you going, my pretty maid, he posed. Donning dangly white pearl earrings and a golden gilt comb, Mary Jones responded with delicate prelude. Together, they eagerly made their way to an alley off Green Street, a known site of prostitution, to take a tour of pleasure. Replaying the sequence of events later that night, Haslam recalled a critical detail. Right as they met, as well as before they parted, Mary, quote, lovingly threw her arms around him and strained him to her heart. It must have been in these moments of uncharacteristic closeness that his pockets messed with. So the next day, Haslam set out to return the mystery wallet to its rightful owner in exchange for information. With success, he learned that the other man had been pickpocketed by the same woman in the same place. But unlike Haslam, he decided against exposing himself to the police. Contrarily, Haslam wanted justice, confessing his story to Constable Bowyer at the local precinct the very next morning. In the early hours of June 15th, an undercover cop propositioned Mary on the Bowery. Where are you going this time of night, he planted. I'm going home, she responded playfully. Will you go too? Unknowingly, Mary escorted the undercover cop into her home in Soho, where she engaged in her regular routine of closeness and affection. Once the man's undercover identity was revealed, a tussle between them ensued, during which Mary is said to have tossed two wallets from her bosom one of which belonged to Haslam. While being escorted to jail, it is alleged she even tried to ditch one more. After the police conducted a full raid of Mary's home, it was discovered that she had an entire trunk full of John's pocketbooks in her possession. Iconic. <laughs> Expecting to find more stolen, stolen belongings attached to her person, Boyer subjected Mary to a full body examination at the jail. But under her dress, the constable discovered a leather something much more interesting than a pocketbook. As reported by the Sun in clumsy Latin, a language intended only to be read by upper class white male readers, Mary, quote, had been fitted with a piece of leather pierced and opened like a woman's vagina, held up by a girdle. In other words, she had no vagina at all. Formally charged with grand larceny, Mary was forced to attend trial. There, she offered testimony and pleaded not guilty, all while neatly dressed in female attire and female wig. According to the Herald, her words provided the greatest merriment in the court, causing the recorder to laugh till he cried. 
As reported by the Sun, the courtroom became so rowdy that at one point a spectator even snatched the wig off her head, exciting a tremendous roar of laughter. After the jury convened on June 18, 1836, Mary was found guilty and sentenced to five years hard labor in Sing Sing State Prison. Just as in Mexico City and at Fort Vancouver, glimpses of Mary's life rest in the archive of her case. From her legal affidavit, we glean some biographical basics. She was 32 years old. She was born and raised in New York City. She had served in the military. And at the time, she was working as a cook and a waitress. In addition to the name Mary Jones, she was also known by Miss Ophelia, Miss June, and Eliza Smith. Unlike in the archive testimonies of the Puebla Amujerados in 1771, which were summarized by a scribe and written in second person, or in the one-sided records of the Coast Salish trans women in the HBC archive, Mary's case holds what could potentially be her exact words, no doubt clung to by everyone at her trial. When prodded for what induced her to wear women's clothing, Mary explained she was first encouraged to do so by the girls of ill fame, or prostitutes, who she used to wait on as a previous job. Further, quote, I have always attended. Oh. I have always attended parties among the people of my own color dressed in this way. And in New Orleans, I have always dressed in this way. In historicizing the racial and sexual strictures in Mary Jones' life, Gil Peterson stresses that. Oh, <laughs> this is really, really good. Love drama. Um, what was trans about her was inseparable from the story of Black gender during the incomplete transition from plantation slavery to industrial capitalism. As illuminated by C. Riley Snorton, the Historical ungendering of Black bodies under chattel slavery meant that, quote, gender, although biologized, was not fixed but fungible, which is to say, revisable within Blackness as a condition of possibility. As such, fungibility or the capaciousness of gender became, quote, a critical practice come performance for Blacks in the antebellum period, during which fugitives commonly cross dressed to escape captivity. With cross dressing, a permanent rather than temporary fixture of Mary's life, one that also seems to have never been enslaved, nowhere is this fungible act clearer. Although born free, Mary grew up in a deeply racially segregated New York City, underpinned by the increasingly polarized politics of pre-Civil War America. At the time of her arrest in 1836, Mary lived just one block away from Lower Manhattan's stop of the Underground Railroad, 36 Lispinard Street which harbored an estimated 600 fugitives throughout the 1830s and 40s, including the famed Frederick Douglass. As aptly concluded by Jonathan Ned Katz, Mary's cross-dressing theft and sexual conduct were sensational in 1836, but not as upsetting or terrifying as they would have been in the early colonial era. Indeed, the life of Mary Jones placed beside the life of the unnamed indigenous trans woman at Fort Vancouver, an early colonial outpost, reveal very different ends. While the latter was quickly banished and extracted from view, Mary unwillingly saw the light of the settler press for the entirety of her adult life, canonized in 1846 even as the notorious Black Rascal. Interestingly, the exact same word used to denigrate the Coast Salish trans woman just two years prior, Rascal. As concluded by Snorton, the historical ungendering or fungibility of Blackness as displayed by Jones represented a larger pseudoscientific project of antebellum America. The story of Mary Jones encapsulates this historical moment, presenting yet again the concomitant type of visibility, but structural and perhaps intentional misrecognition of the trans feminine sex worker in the colonial North American imaginary, a figure far from insignificant in the settler state's transformation into the governing and oppressive entity we know and experience it to be today. In conclusion, jumping from colonial New Spain, fur trade Oregon country, to antebellum New York, these diverse tales of trans sex workers living under three distinct but uh, uh, connected imperial regimes reveal important insights into 
the strictures that mediated their lives, and in some cases, deaths. As such, these stories also unveil the varying underground and counter-colonial worlds from which these women and many others like them came. Placed together, they suggest an established and widespread inter-imperial project of transsexual regulation across colonial North America, in which the racialized trans feminine figure and her constant demonization was central. Building on Two-Spirit scholar Deborah Miranda's theorization of gender side, I conclude in my article that an operative logic of trans feminine elimination pervaded under at least the Spanish empire, as is demonstrated in the 1658 execution. Pulling in these two additional stories. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, pulling in the two additional stories, it seems that this gendered project actually exceeded imperial borders and importantly found a core threat in not just trans womanhood, but trans women's transgressive sexualities specifically. Thus, a co constitutive and I think integral relationship between trans femininity and sex work is evidenced throughout the ages as trans women of various origins and circumstances lived, resisted, and persisted within and against colonial worlds that were very actively ordered to exclude them. Just as we illuminate the trans misogyny that various trans sex workers faced before the 20th century, so do we glimpse great moments of trans feminine creativity and survivance in the face of ongoing suppression. Mary's arrest in 1836 was in fact only one of over 11 scuffles with the law. Her arrest in 1830, uh, across the next two decades after 1836, she would spend a total of seven years in penitentiaries, arrested again and again for vagrancy and disorderly conduct for wearing women's clothing. But just as the trans women in Mexico City who successfully warned their sisters and escaped arrest in the 1650s, or the indigenous trans women who, despite being allegedly flogged, I don't know if I believe that, uh, returned again and again to the fort, Mary can be witnessed going back to her same life in the same place in the same neighborhood with the same names and fashionable women's attire over and over and over again. Today in what some call the colonial present, trans feminine sex workers abound across North America, no doubt as the living legacy of this first tree. Careful, you're getting close to the oh. stop share. Thank you, that's what yeah. I needed, this whole. <laughs> But just as demonstrated in these stories, these women continue to face egregious violence, especially those of us who are Black, Indigenous, and or Latino. Averaging the past five years of data from the Trans Murder Monitoring Project, at least one trans woman on average is murdered every single day in the 21st century. Today, a trans woman was brutally murdered. The US and Mexico, the sites of this history shared must also be acknowledged for reporting the second and third largest numbers of annual deaths in the world, only after Brazil. In addition to sharing geographic, racial, and sometimes national positions, nearly half of all trans women murdered across the world in the 21st century are also sex workers. Using the story of Mary Jones, Gil Peterson hypothesizes that trans womanhood in North America arose, quote, as a way of life in the wake of state and capitalist dispossession. Looking at the two other micro histories from colonial New Spain and the fur trade, I would only add that in myriad indigenous contexts, at least, it seems that trans women, in fact, preceded the settler state itself. Trans womanhood is older than the settler states of Mexico, the US and Canada. Just as Mary Jones' engagement with sex work paved an otherwise inaccessible path towards freedom, albeit fraught, it seems that the trans women of colonial Mexico City and in the Pacific Northwest followed similar paths to achieve the same, but not without immense scrutiny and violence. Under the continuity of these regimes and our colonial present, trans womanhood remains highly connected to sex work. Spending my late teen and early adult years in New York City, Sex work was inseparable from my becoming a woman, and in fact, my education. Unable to pursue traditional labor in the earliest period of my transition, I couldn't get hired anywhere. And already coming from a position of poverty, sex work provided me the resources and time necessary to complete my first university degree, 
specifically to write my bachelor's honors thesis, which got me into grad school, which got me into starting my PhD. In a not so abstract way then, it was through sex work that the very history of trans sex work you are hearing today was made possible. And I have permission to share that sex work has played a role in the lives of all three of us trans women PhD students who are part of this event today. While our conditions are exceptionally different across space, time, and subject position, it is sex work. And I hope our insistence to continually make something out of nothing that ties all of us together. Just as in the past, we trans women forged lives bound by great complexity and creativity. As I began, trans history is the history of sex work. But along with that trans history exists trans present. And with that trans present trails, a trans future, one in which sex work as it has for centuries may very well continue to help us pave the way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jamie. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna open it to questions from all of you here in person, but people who are also attending in Zoom world, um, feel welcome to ask questions in the Q&A little option and we will read it out. So, who would like to ask our wonderful presenter a question first? Yes. And make sure to project. Yes. All right. And I'd love to know name too. Uh, Shivam is my name. Uh, I'm also a PhD candidate here. Well, student, but cool. Um, <laughs> my question was with sex work and trans femininity be so integrated historically and even now in many places across the world, do you think that protections for sex work, labor protections for sex work, would also benefit trans femme folks? Yes. <laughs> yeah, very fundamentally in the fact that the vast majority of us build our lives through sex work temporarily or across um, yeah, so very concretely, but also, you know, abstractly, metaphorically, um, we're not all free until everyone is free. And I think um, uh, a measure for the level of liberation that we're pursuing um, is certainly if we are including sex workers, if sex worker voices are being amplified, um, and if we are, yeah, prioritizing those needs, which affect all of us. Thank you for that question. Who else has a question? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Han. Thank you. Um, I'm a PhD student in political science. I do political theory. Thank you for your um, lecture. I'm just, this is, uh, okay. Like you don't have to answer, but like I'm trying to sort of throw in like a speculative thing, which is, um, Okay, so if I were a, if I were a trans femme person and my sex work is signified through the logic of the gift economy, and then and then part of the colonial violence is being imposed the other like more violent definition of that being a sin against nature. I don't know, like I'm trying to I, I guess I'm trying to imagine like how that would have felt, but how, what kind of a violence that is, that would have been for that person whose sex work was signified um, less problematic, unproblematically through the logic of the gift economy, but then, yeah, like what are the, like the definitional, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just rambling. No, it's a really great inquiry that, you know, I can't answer because I'm not, I'm not that person, but I'm, um, and my subject position is so different than, yeah. let's say, an indigenous trans woman being othered um, and scrutinized and receiving violence. But um, it has to be world shattering. And it has to be also not separated or different than the larger world shattering effects of colonization whatsoever and the denigration of all other aspects of their lives. Um, and yeah, you know, the, the suppression of um, indigenous trans femmes, indigenous trans women were part and parcel with a larger and structural long-term suppression of indigeneity together. So 
I don't see their transness and their sex work uh, engagement and sex work as like isolated. They're very much connected to what I, from what I can understand from my limited knowledge um, to their indigeneity and themselves and who they were, how they were connected to the land, how they were connected to their communities and the people around them. Um, that was all interwoven. So you lose one part of that in a way you kind of lose it all. Um, but again, that's my speculation of how they could have them. Thank you. So, Oh, there isn't a line question, but we could just take your question right now. Yeah. Oh, is, is there someone online who has posed your question? Okay, yeah. go for it. Okay. So this comes from Meg Foster. Uh, this is a fabulous presentation, just a question about sources. What is the impact of these trans women being documented in crime archives slash through their encounters with what colonists labeled crime? What opportunities and barriers do these archives offer for capturing these people's experiences? Mm. Um, barriers? Lots. There are endless <laughs> barriers to um, using a, a colonial archive or a criminal archive in order to try and parse out stories of those who were criminalized. Um, but I'm inspired by Indigenous historians, uh, Lisa Brooks and Jenny O'Brien, who uh, used the colonial archive judiciously towards anti-colonial means. So not throwing out the archive altogether because of its violence, because of its word usage, um, because of um, how biased it is, but trying to read through in between the lines, read against the archival grain to see what can be gleaned from those stories in order to tell a different, uh, to give a different picture of what happened. Um, and specifically in these cases, you know, in Mary Jones case, she is interviewed by the court and there's a full transcript of her words, although mediated by a court scribe. And who knows if they wrote down every word exactly how she said it, but we learn a lot about her life. There are a lot of windows that are provided to us as the future readers, especially us who are trans, especially for black trans femmes reading her um, transcription, who are able to read way more through the in between the lines. There are things that she's kind of dropping for us, like little hints into her life. And I think that's the kind of history that we have to do as, as, as trans historians, especially before the 20th century. We have such like little glimmers and glimpses of trans life in the past. Um, the same was with the Mexico City sodomy trials. All of these women were also interviewed and, and gave testimony, again, mediated through scribe and written in, in the third person. So it's kind of chunky. And then if you go from the Spanish original uh, language through an English translation, um, there are a whole other host of issues there. Um, but you can still learn. I mean, every single thing that I shared in this paper about Gotita, Stampa, and their trans feminine cohort, that all came from the criminal archive. Every single detail I have about their life, um, about where they lived, what they did, how they would quarrel over guacos and drink chocolate and dance. These were all things that were recorded by them or testimonies of people in their lives around them who, uh, yeah, gave witness to what their lives looked like. So barriers, lots, opportunities, maybe more opportunities than barriers. I like to think. Okay, so the questions are like really rolling in. <laughs> Chris has uh, set up a nice little order of things. Yeah, you can see one of the questions that are coming. Uh, no, I just mean like, <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. I I will. I have an opportunity to ask questions later. So okay, let's let's go to the uh, the waiting hordes online here. Um, yeah, the, the phone lines are lighting up. Um, <laughs> right. So I'm going to desperately try to find Margaret's uh, question. Um, and uh, of course, I'm not going to be able to. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this comes from Margaret Middleton. Thanks so much. Have you seen these stories interpreted in museums? Any recommendations for best practice for interpreting these stories for the public? Hmm. Um, a friend of mine, um, Kai Pyle, tweeted, I think literally today, and they were like, we need to adapt this uh, mid-17th century trans-feminine mestiza subculture into like a, a pose style kind of drama show about their lives, um, which I wholeheartedly support. If there are any directors in the room, hit us up. Um, but on that example, I know the story of La Cotita is, uh, is, is famous across Mexico, I think for the past 15 years from what I understand. 
um, not living there myself, is that uh, her story has been included in Pride celebrations for many, many years. I would be surprised if a community theater of trans folks have not like, created <laughs> a, a theatrical production about her and, her and others' lives. Um, so those sources have been studied and been readily available to community for a while. Um, I don't know if I would, uh, yeah, museums. Um, no, I, I'm a historian and I don't often go to museums. I think because what I study is not in museums. Um, but that would be super cool. And if you're a curator, hit me up. <laughs> yeah, but no, I haven't seen haven't seen them like that. And, oh, Tourmaline, uh, Black trans femme historian and activist, has done a lot of work on Mary Jones, including creating a speculative documentary called Salacia. Um, so look into Tourmaline's work for Mary Jones. Yeah, and I get. Uh, let's do another in-person event. Okay, uh, yes, right. Hi. Hi, my name is Kanika. I'm a PhD student here in Cinema Studies and Social Diversity Studies. I study surveillance through trans studies. This is a fantastic talk, thank you so much. Um, I guess one of the things I've been thinking about, and this is a methodology question, when you talk about like counter histories and working against the archival grain, which I really like that framing, is do you see your work as curating or trying to formulate a counter archive within the archive? Um, yeah, I guess that that's a great question. And um, it's also encouraging to maybe do other things. I need to, okay, I need to do, I'm just signed up for a lot right now. Um, so when I say counter archival, for me, I'm specifically thinking about the method of reading and looking at archives. I've never myself created an archive. Um, the university I go to, UVic, has the world's largest repository of trans history called the UVic Trans Archives. I've um, never used it because there's nothing before the 20th century. Um, but yeah, no, that creating a counter archive, like a physical or digital counter archive has not been part of my work. Or, although I do have like spreadsheets upon spreadsheets of mentions of trans indigenous people in the colonial archive that I'm like now starting to map and put, pull together. And maybe there's a digital uh, potential there, though I'm famously bad with computers. So but if there's a digital humanities person in here. You know, um, yeah, thank you for that question. Speaking of being bad at computers, great transition. Uh, so we're going to have yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, an online caller, Zeb Tortorici. Uh, yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Jamie for this fabulous uh, presentation and really beautiful project. Um, and thank you for the shout out, really nice. Um, I would love to sort of hear you think about different possibilities of narration. I really love the kind of cross approach and multi-imperial approach that you're taking. Um, it's also reminding me of the work of Saidia Hartman in Critical Fabulation or Marisa Fuentes in Dispossessed Lives and sort of thinking about what possibilities of narration, narration exist for the, those situations and subjectivities for which we have such an archival lack. Yeah, and thank you so much. Oh my gosh, no, thank thank you. It's so good to meet you. Um, and big fan of your work. And yeah, so yeah, definitely critical fabulation is on my mind a lot. Um, my dissertation in particular is working with a lot of speculation, speculative history and writing. Um and yeah, thank you. Give me something to think about around narration. Right. In person questions. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I have a methodological question. Um, so I've also read your gender and history article, and, and both of them seem like they're um like kind of grounded in very particular case studies, but like scaling up from them. Um and uh also like cover like an enormous amount of historical ground. So I'm, I'm interested in kind of like what that method of, of history, writing history does, and like also potentially like what are the limitations of like specific case studies that like scaling up them. Yeah, totally. Thank you for that. Um, so question on limitations of 
methodology. I consider my me my methodology so far. I'm a PhD candidate. I'm still figuring it out. I've only written and published one thing. But um, <laughs> I just started my dissertation. Um, but yeah, I'm seeing myself as more as a micro historian, and I think um, I am really inspired by Jules Gill Peterson's articulation and call for a materialist history, a materialist trans woman with colors history of sexuality, and that is looking at context. So not just telling a story of violence and oppression, which is certainly in a way where I started, like wanting to historicize this immense violence that was right in front of me, but I wasn't seeing being given a history um, towards, towards context. And so for me right now, that is not just like a colonial imperial context that define like the outer world, but also an individual and communal context, specifically in indigenous case studies, um, where we can kind of restory or uh, re-narrate um, these sometimes well-known stories kind of from the bottom up, from the individual outward. Because um, yeah, these stories thus far have been told about these women who are also not described as women, they're described as often a feminine men or homosexuals or men dressed as women. Um, and so that is a big historiographical intervention I'm trying to make there. Um, and I think a micro history can do justice to that by really zooming in as much as possible, but still thinking about the outer world. Um, but there are absolute limits. Like I would consider all my conclusions for this to be tentative. And it, one could argue that I'm reaching as well to make an argument about colonial North America with the story of just 16 trans women from across three centuries, across three different geographies. Um, so there are a lot of blanks to fill up in the middle to make it more um, firm. But I think micro histories allow us to get towards something and then work towards a bigger project. So I hope that answers your question. And Chris is setting up someone. There's also one right here. Okay. There are a follow up. Um, I'm I'm curious as to whether you consider yourself on the same page as Jules Gill Peterson as to like how you refer to these historical folks. She writes, you know, about trans misogyny. Um, she sort of theorizes it as a practice, <laughs> a multi century long practice that like racializes and, and feminizes like many peoples, most of whom we don't have their perspective there at, um, in the archive. And so she's trying to like both like you know, you <laughs> walk this like narrow path that also speaks against <laughs> those who would insist, you know, to court that these aren't trans women. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'm curious, it sounds like, I, I, I'd love to hear you speak on that. Yeah, thank you for that question because I think about it a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm, sh I'm a huge fan of Jules Gill Peterson. I think I cited her about 20 times <laughs> in this paper. Um, but I do think I've seen a shift in her writing and her lecturing um, away from a hesitation to apply a framework of trans womanhood by talking about trans femininity to now kind of like declaring trans womanhood, which is actually a path that I followed through my research as well. Um, but she is attentive to, you know, studying the globe outside of North America and really from early 19th century onwards. So we kind of she kind of starts with Mary Jones, and Mary Jones is the latest case study. I study um, 1830s and 40s. Um, she is using in her new book, A Short History of Trans Misogyny, the concept of trans feminization. So, as you say, trans misogyny is a practice that trans feminizes populations. And I think this is a really, really interesting and productive. Uh, tool that I have not yet applied. I mean, I just got the book a week ago, mm -hmm. but um, I haven't yet applied to my lens because I really do think, um, you know, transness certainly has been critiqued for as long as it's been around as a Western colonial concept and idea. Um, but I really strictly don't use words like transgender or transsexual. Um, I'm using a short and trans, which I don't see as an identity, because I think to, I think identity, like self-possessed gender identity is so 21st century and so right now and so not pre-20th century at least. Um, and so I'm never really talking about identity. I'm more so talking about these people were positioned as women. They were women. They didn't identify as, as a woman. They were treated, they were seen, they lived as women and they experienced misogyny as women. Um, 
And so I'm, I'm not shy right now of using trans as a descriptor rather than an identity marker to name this kind of historical pattern. Because I think there's something powerful to um, not trying, not conflating everything, like looking at everything very localized within specific national, tribal, and communal contexts, but kind of threading similarities of trans femininity across time and geographies. Um, there's something to say there that I think is lost by avoiding a word like trans. Um, and yeah, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. So I think next we have another uh, internet uh, question from Maggie from the University of Toronto. So Maggie, hopefully, okay, great. We, we see you and I hope we hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yeah, I'm actually from, I'm from the University of Winnipeg, actually. Um, I'm really excited by the research that you're doing, Jamie. Um, and I, I, I had a question along similar lines to, to the previous one, uh, specifically about the, like, just uh, the interpretation of something you said in your paper of the same name as this lecture. Um, you said on page three, I have yet to come across a historical interpretation, including Deborah Miranda's canonical theory of gender side, that names the recurring violence enacted against these subjects in its particularity. Um, Miranda, in her article, identifies this violence as targeting a th third gender, primarily, and t t targeting two-spirited people, um, to use the sort of more modern uh, pan-Indigenous term. Uh, my question then is, what material difference does it make to read colonial oppression of what one might call uh, gender subversion as trans-feminine versus as oppression of a third gender uh, beyond uh, semantics? I guess. Sorry. <laughs> Bit of a wordy one. Yeah, no, perfect. Thank you, uh, Maggie, for that question. Um, it's simple. As far as I can tell, um, Indigenous trans men were not hunted down and murdered in the way that trans women were. And um, that kind of holds today. You know, over 98% of reported murders of trans people are of trans femmes and trans women. I've seen that historically recorded across time. Uh, trans, mis trans misandry is absolutely real, um, but I think we miss something in trying to talk about gender side when we're not talking about femininity and misogyny. Um, and yeah, this kind of, because Deborah Miranda's article, Elimination of the Hoyas, uh, which is also about the Spanish empire in, in Alta California, Spanish California, um, uh, uses the gender side and describes these people as third gender. And I'm countering that by describing them as trans feminine because third gender is yet again another indistinct term that doesn't name femininity and therefore can't do justice to structural misogyny, trans misogyny, and acknowledging that um, a very specific type of gender, not just a transgender, was targeted. It was trans femininity. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to rearticulate by saying, calling it colonial trans misogyny, not just gender side of third gender people. Um, yeah, because I think a lot of is conflated and lost and unacknowledged when we use very vague language like that. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I, I found something definitely similar in my preliminary research. Just to like, I don't know, I've, I've been doing a similar, I guess, sort of research I guess on similar lines, sort of historicize the relationship between sex work and trans femininity in Winnipeg. But I've been having very much trouble finding any sources about that in the Manitoba Gay and Lesbian Archive. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely something that I've 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 found as well um, with respect to um, like the perceptions of of trans women versus trans men. So yeah, thank you for for that answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that research. Great. In person, again, go for it. Sorry. Um, another question, mostly building on what you guys were just talking about, but even just looking at femininity and masculinity as binary or as a bimodal uh, expression of gender is very colonial. So I'm wondering if you came across any examples of trans femme folks or trans folks in general that were outside of the structured binary. So not taking a women's place, but a non-binary trans type person. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that possibility I'm, I'm remaining open to finding and trying not to conflate and ignore by just applying a, a trans womanhood, trans feminine 
perspective. Um, although the more I work with source material, the more I study specific context, the less I'm convinced that, and it's very popular, and I you know wrote my undergrad thesis called Breaking the Binary, you know, the colonial gender binary, whatnot. Um, I'm not convinced that completely bimodal approaches to gender are inherently colonial. Um, in almost every um, indigenous context in which I am working and closely studying within this context, there was an operative and very strict gender binary. And that is how these people existed. Because for a trans person to exist to transgress something, they have to have something to transgress. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm just, I started from a point of this is a colonial construct and we need to tell the stories of those in between and beyond. But the closer I'm getting to the actual stories and the sources, the more I'm convinced that this construct is quite universal, not completely universal. Um, and, uh, but there are differences between a colonial gender binary and for example, a Mesoamerican gender binary and that the restrictions could have looked similarly or the definitions of masculinity and femininity were um, binary, but there was space and expectation and room and acceptance for people to move across. Um, but but as far as like a non-binary kind of expression, um, I'm not sure yet. I haven't found, um, I mean, yeah, there just, it begs the question, being trans, transgressing gender, does that have to be something you do your entire life? Because a lot of subjects don't. A lot of subjects go back and forth for various reasons. So in that, that is an extremely helpful and important framework to hold of not applying, you know, another kind of like concrete gendered lens. Um, there's something powerful to me about asserting that they were women, recognizing like their specific cultural context, but, I would be remiss to assume that there wasn't kind of some non-binary fluctuation and exploration. Yes. Just to build on that, uh, do you think the definition of women is espoused by what they do, what kind of roles they play in society then, or is it espoused by bodily being, like biological makeup? Right. And I mean, that's that is among the first questions I have to answer in studying a particular context. So like within the Nahua context, indigenous context that culturally spread across much of Southern North America and Central America, uh, gender was not biologized. It was not fixed to a sexed body. And therefore a boy could grow up to become a woman by simply dressing as one or performing the labor of one um, or living yeah, within a feminine community. Um, and to me, that feels like a very natural and inevitable thing that happens. And I certainly was a boy who grew up to be a woman. So I, I relate to that. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, and now I think Claire Becker uh, has a question from the internet. <laughs> um, and so you should be able to show video and unmute yourself or I did something wrong. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, sweet. I do have a question from the internet. I'm Claire. I'm from, oh, did I cut out? Okay. Um, I'm from the University of Rochester. I think we met super briefly over Zoom for the um, historicizing trans pasts, like yeah. planning session. Um, but congrats on that article. And thanks for this talk. This was great. I have a question that I hope isn't like too off topic. Um I am sort of wondering, like, to what extent you see your work as connected with, like, the histories of cis sex work. Like, I'm wondering, for example, if sex work would have been punished, like, similarly in New Spain when gender transgression wasn't as much of a factor. Like, to what extent was the criminalization about the sex work and to what extent was it just more about gender expression, if we can even separate the two in that case? Mm. Such a good question. Thank you, Claire. Um, I it is an element of this research I have not uh, done. I'm, so this I was invited to write a chapter of only seven thousand words, and that's where this paper comes from. And so I wasn't given a lot of space in order to do more research. Um, and so thinking about the relationships of trans sex workers to cis sex workers, I'm not totally sure as far as histories of suppression go. I would assume it's across the board. I assume there's an extra level of 
scrutiny with the intersection of transness um, and falling within this colonial category of sodomy, which really was the problem at the time. Um, and in all of these stories, the Fort Vancouver one thus far is speculative, but in all of them, these trans sex workers were in cahoots and community and inspired by cis sex workers as well. I would be shocked if they weren't in full community um, and lived together and worked at the same brothels and did the same work. Um, your question brings up another really important uh, omission on my part, which is that I'm studying those who were falsely, I believe, described as men just as women. And that doesn't capture those who passed. Hmm. Those who like truly were not caught by the colonial regime um, and were just facing, you know, blatant misogyny rather than trans misogyny. Um, and so that that is something to think about. I think Sam you were reading Puta Life and telling me about sex workers like in the next century. And you saw a picture and you're like, I think she's trans or something. We weren't sure, which of course is a problematic practice, but obviously <laughs> we do it all day. Um, um, so yeah, I think there are total possibilities. Um, yeah, anyway, so just got my, my gears going. Um, thanks for your question. Yeah, thank you. I think. Uh, it's in-person question, right? Hi. Um, as you work towards the professorship, um, I I am curious curious to how um, you see your research and teaching practice, how they dovetail, and what you see is the possibilities inherent in not only teaching these types of histories, but also also the methodology, as you so wonderfully described it, reading against the grain and liberating these stories from the colonial and criminal archives like I'm just wondering if if you don't have an answer that's totally fine I just was I'm just so curious about uh how this will play out in a teaching capacity for you yeah thank you for that question um I've, I've begun teaching as a sessional um in gender studies at my uni I got to teach my first class in the fall it's called intro to trans histories um and yeah, it, it's I'm so new to instructing and I have a whole lot to learn. I just got my course reviews. Um, <laughs> but they, they were all good. There's just one student that was, oh, I can't. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure. um, um, yeah, no, I'm 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 sorting that out. Um, I found that yeah, counter archival against the grain method was the focus of my class. I mean, I couldn't not teach trans history the way that I'm doing it to my students. Um, I have 30 students, 20 of them were trans, majority transitioned as kids and teens. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's the first time that's ever happened. Um, Cause I live in uh, Victoria, no lands of the Lekwungen peoples. And um, uh, yeah, and so it, when you say teaching, I'm thinking of teaching trans students, trans history, cause that was really my focus. And they were centered in my class and prioritized in my class. Um, and I think one thing that we were able to do, back to a question on museums, as uh, I created my last um, my class final, it was called a counter archival trans histories museum. So they each did counter archival research throughout term, which was, um, and created a display to display in a collective museum together on the last day of class. And three students uh, worked together to recreate the trunk of uh, stolen John's pocketbooks owned by Mary Jones in the 1830. <laughs> I meant to put the picture up on my slide. Um, and a bunch of other, a bunch of other absolutely incredible things. And so these were either recreated objects like the chest, which existed and we know about, it's described, or they were speculative. Um, like the map of Chinaha Prophet, Kankong Kamiklaula, the map he used to cross the Columbia River with fur traders after he was transformed into a man by the French in 1809. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm starting to do that with my students who are awesome to, and very patient with me because I did not know what I was doing my first semester. <laughs> Perfect. Back to the internet. The information superhighway and, uh, and Nancy B, please answer, or please ask your question. Hello, uh, from France. Um, I uh, have a question um, about methodology again. Um, I'm curious to understand more about the centering of sex work in trans history. 
uh, to use your words, particularly for those trans feminine people who didn't want to engage in sex work. Um, I'm thinking more from a European perspective with my question and thinking of this as a general approach for trans history. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, it's it's tricky and I'm um, actually working through some of my conclusions which I read in the paper because I'm not sure, you know, all of these stories are necessarily the stories of liberation that I want them to be or survivance. Um, like we know in the in the Fort Vancouver case that uh, it's a long time uh, sex work like within Coast Salish tradition has a long time significance for gift giving or cementing alliances. Um, but I can't say for sure that this trans feminine sex worker was necessarily doing that. Um, 1834, the winter of, the, of this event was two years after um, a measles outbreak that would have decimated her community. Uh, it was 50 years since the Spanish first uh, landed on Haida Wai. Um, and yeah, so the conditions of her life at that point, it could have represented a millennia long Coast Salish tradition of trans femininity and sex work, which I think is what I wanted to say. But the more I think about it, the more possible it is that it, that was something she was forced into because of the changing colonial conditions of her world. Um, and obviously it didn't necessarily work out for her. And in that particular instance, I don't know the rest of her story, but yeah, thinking about, yeah, the sex work historiography and this kind of engagement with the question of whether they wanted to engage in sex work or not. I think it's, yeah, it's very possible that in a lot of these trans sex work cases, um, they were not, you know, liberatory expressions of sexuality. They were forced uh, into doing so because of the conditions of the world. But I think in accepting those conditions, I think trans women historically have been able to flip that around and turn it into something else. Um, I like to think something that, yeah, anyway, I'll stop there. That's a really good question to get me to keep thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it is 5.58, for you later. <laughs> I was getting a thumb can. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Uh, 5.58, anyone has any last urging questions before we tie up the night? Or <laughs> Yeah, I do. I've been trying to actually narrow it down from a, a more broad topic. The one part that really, I guess, stuck out to me was the sort of forced emasculation of, she has no name, but she, rascal, I guess. <laughs> that was forced, when you say it was forced, is that um, the history or is that your interpretation? Was there any connection to that? And with like like modern like medicalization of, of transness, was there any connection to that? that yeah, happened, I guess. So, such a good question. Um, I think from the doctor's trans misogynistic words and comments, I assume that it was a forced operation that he inflicted on her um, because of his religious beliefs. And back in Europe at the time, the pillory was still legal and in the 1830s there was a rise in sodomy accusations like public sodomy accusations so he was existing in a time where these people were very publicly called out and then uh, physically assaulted and arrested and whatnot um but yeah there is something interesting about um you know ken con kemic paula the tanaha trans masculine prophet of the same era i think who actually passes away around this time i don't remember um he described his transformation, he claimed that he was surgically transfor uh, transformed by the French when um, he was living as a fur trade wife um, um, at a French uh, trade fort. So that story would have definitely been circulating. She would have known that story. So that's why in my speculative questions at the end, I'm like, was she thinking about that? Because he describes it, from what I understand from the oral histories, as like a liberatory moment where he was transformed into what he was meant to be and the French were they can do more than we could even imagine. Um, so understanding that context, I don't know. Um, but as far as was it something she wanted or asked for, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I 
interesting. Yeah, interesting. Do, being trans, doing trans history, I actually like had, I just had my orchiectomy, which is the modern and anesthetized castration um, while doing this history. And yeah, going through that healing process and everything, the, it would have been a traumatic experience for her. Um, and yeah, it leads me to think that she didn't ask for it. Yeah. When you say it was done with religious intent, that stuck out to me. That's such a, well, that would make sense for, for back then, but it is such an interesting reason to state why that it was it was his re like religious belief to yeah. castrate her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that just, it stuck out to me. Yeah. In turn, she would have physiologically feminized as well. So there's there's something to think about there, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, thank you for that. Thank you, everybody.